Early on the morning of Saturday, December 16th, 2000, Jerry Michael Williams indulged one of his favorite hobbies, duck hunting on Lake Seminole. Lake Seminole straddled the state line between Florida and Georgia. His wife, Denise, said he went on the hunting trip alone, which was an unusual occurrence for the young man. He has never been seen since. It being the eve of their sixth wedding anniversary, the couple had planned to depart for a romantic weekend getaway as soon as Mike returned. Denise expected him home around noon, when they were going to bring their 19-month-old daughter, Ansley, to Denise's sister's Deanna's house, who would care for her during the couple's weekend getaway. Denise called Mike several times on his cell phone, but didn't receive a reply. All her calls went to voicemail. And one thing about Mike was, he was constantly running late. Yet, when he still hadn't arrived home by 2 p.m., Denise grew concerned and called her father. This sort of behavior was very unlike the normally responsible and considerate young husband and father. Denise then called Cheryl, Mike's mother, and his brother Nick to let them know of her concerns. It wasn't long before the troops were rallied and an all-out search was mounted at Lake Seminole in the town of Sneed, Florida. Denise's father Warren and a hunting buddy of Mike's were the first to arrive at the lake. They located Mike's truck, but the boat trailer was empty, and there was no sign of Mike or his boat. Mike's father-in-law grew concerned and realized that there was a race against darkness at 3 p.m. on this early winter day. So he called the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, who had jurisdiction over the lake. And we're going to say uh, FWC for short. FWC officers arrived within minutes and concentrated their search efforts in an area of the lake nicknamed Stump Field. It was nicknamed this because of the hundreds of dead trees and stumps that littered this area of the lake uh, lurking just below the surface, creating invisible hazards. Searchers observed eight or nine large alligators measuring up to 12 feet long in the area of Mike's boat just a few hours into the search. Mike himself was still nowhere in sight. The search for Mike would continue unabated until February of 2001. Pretty early on, the FWC developed a working hypothesis. Mike's boat hit a hidden stump, pitching him overboard and filling with water the chest-high waders he always wore when duck hunting, making it impossible for him to either regain his boat or swim to safety. Additionally, his body never surfaced because it was likely consumed by the numerous alligators that were obviously in the area. Despite ample evidence to the contrary, the FWC would cling to this theory for years, as would many others after the story was reported in the newspaper. One person who did not buy into this theory was Cheryl, Mike's mother. She began her own investigation into what happened to her younger child, not believing that he was dead, not until she at least saw his body for herself. Cheryl and her older son, Nick, went to the lake to participate in the search and hopefully uncover evidence that would lead them to Mike's location and fate. It was an endeavor that would consume her for the next 18 years. But one individual that was absent from the search was Mike's wife, Denise. She closeted herself in her bedroom, venturing out only for meals and leaving the care of Ansley to friends and family who would remain by her side throughout the entire ordeal. Denise and Mike were friends with a couple named Brian and Kathleen Winchester. They had all been friends since high school, but Brian and Mike had been friends since uh, middle school and were frequent hunting partners. In fact, Brian was supposed to have accompanied Mike on this trip to Lake Seminole, but had called in the middle of the night to cancel leaving Mike to the trip alone. Denise would later tell authorities that Mike had always planned to go alone. And 10 days into the search, a camouflage pattern hat appeared out of nowhere, found tangled in hydrilla near the island close to where Mike's body was located. The hat's condition appeared almost new and wasn't covered in slime or anything like that, as it likely would have been had it been submerged in the lake for almost two weeks. Brian Winchester identified the hat as being similar to one Mike purchased on a recent hunting trip. Now, 80 people have drowned in Lake Seminole prior to Mike's disappearance in late 2000, and all 80 have floated to the surface, all except Mike. As the days turned into weeks, he remained stubbornly missing without a trace. Mike was employed as a real estate appraiser by a husband and wife team, Clay and Patty Ketchum, who loved Mike as a son. They mentored Mike in the business and were thrilled with his stellar work ethic and drive to succeed. Mike was earning close to $180,000 a year at the time of his disappearance. Instead of straight salary, 
Mike earned commission on the jobs he completed, and at 31, had become something of a workaholic. Mike would arrive at the office before anyone else, and could usually be found laboring in his office at midnight. And it's said that even though he was a workaholic, he would still make time to spend time with Ansley, and sometimes he would take her to the office with him just to get a little more time with her. Now, by all accounts, Mike was a devoted father and husband, but before his disappearance, he had been confiding in friends that he was unhappy in his marriage because his wife had stopped all physical intimacy since the pregnancy and birth of his daughter. Denise suffered from postpartum depression and would refuse his advances and understand that postpartum depression is a terrible, terrible thing that some women go through, so it's understandable when this is happening. Now, their anniversary trip on that Saturday, he disappeared, was supposed to reignite their love life and renew intimacy between the couple. And in, Mike and Denise had announced their plans to have a second child together, actually. But obviously that would never happen. Another issue that was troubling Mike was Denise's repeated violation of an agreement that the couple had to check with each other if they planned to spend more than $50. Mike had discovered ATM cash withdrawals for thousands of dollars for which Denise had no valid reasons, telling him a confused story about needing the money to buy a large amount of marijuana to make pot brownies to treat her postpartum depression. Now, because of this, Mike was angry and concerned and told his close friend Brian Winchester that if things didn't change, he was ready to go before a judge to gain sole custody of Ansley, for whom he was gravely concerned. Brian talked his friend into giving the situation more time to resolve itself before taking such drastic actions. Brian Winchester was employed as a financial planner in his father, Marcus's firm. He sold several insurance policies to Mike over the years, uh, most recently a $1.25 million policy, in addition to two other policies that Mike uh, was going to let lapse. Unbeknownst to Mike, Denise had kept up paying the premiums on the other policies, which altogether totaled almost $2 million. Long before he would have been declared dead, and while the active search for Mike was still in full swing, on January 4th, just 19 days after Mike went missing, Denise contacted the insurance company who issued the million-dollar policy to collect on these benefits. However, Florida required a full five-year period to pass before a person could legally be declared dead. Denise had to hire an attorney to petition the Florida courts to have a death certificate issued immediately for her missing husband based on the circumstances. And guess what? Mike's mother, Cheryl, knew nothing about this. Just three months after hiring a probate attorney to help her have Mike declared legally dead, a miraculous development came to light. On Lake Seminole, which had been searched extensively for several months, a local fisherman who was very familiar with the search for Mike Williams found a pair of hunting waders floating in the water. He immediately called a neighbor who worked for the FWC, and the entire area was searched again. This time, investigators also found a flashlight, one that was identical to the flashlight Mike had borrowed from his mother, Cheryl. It was actually in perfect working order. They also received a hunting jacket similar to the one Mike had worn on the day he vanished. In the pocket of that jacket, with the unlaminated type clearly visible, was a hunting license issued in Arkansas bearing Mike Williams' name and signature. All three of these items were found in the deepest area of the lake, directly over a large hole in the lake bottom. These details would be included in her court petition, and on June 29, 2001, Denise was successful in having her missing husband declared legally dead. Her next step was to amp up her claim to the life insurance benefits. She would be successful and eventually receive a payout on all three policies, totaling $1.8 million. While all of this was happening, Mike's mom, Cheryl, never stopped working hard to try to find out what had happened on that cold December morning. She was relentless in her efforts, a one-woman crusade against the odds and the powers that be. She implored the FWC to conduct a criminal investigation and was rebuffed each time, as the case, while technically active, had gone cold since the discovery of the waiters, the jacket, and the flashlight. The FWC was clinging to its theory that Mike drowned and had been eaten by alligators. Cheryl continued her efforts regardless. She took out full-page ads in the newspaper, giving the details of the investigation and asking for the public's assistance. She put up flyers on trees and businesses. She rented billboards uh, with Mike's photo. She marched through town waving a sign with Mike's photo, imploring anyone who would listen to help. 
she wrote a letter a day, every day, to the governor of Florida asking him to compel an investigation. She did these things out of her motherly love, day after day, year after year, with no visible sign of success or progress. It was her son, and how could she not do whatever was in her power to find him? And as a parent, I feel exactly the same way. I can't imagine what she and everyone else who's had to go through similar situations has gone through. It's, it's impossible uh, for me to imagine. Now, three years after Mike's disappearance, Cheryl received a visit from Brian Winchester and Denise. Now, see, they had actually started openly dating one another, and their visit coincided with an article written by an investigative journalist who had taken an interest in Mike's case and Cheryl's quest for answers. Denise was livid and angrily demanded that Cheryl call off the investigation by the FWC, who had experienced a recent staffing change, and new detectives had reopened Mike's case. So it seems like there might actually finally be some answers to some questions, and I think we can all sort of see where this is going, and Denise is obviously not happy about it. Denise threatened Cheryl that if she did not accept the official theory that Mike had drowned and stopped provoking an investigation, that she would never see her only granddaughter, Ansley, again. Cheryl tried reasoning with her, one mother to another, but to no avail. The visit turned ugly and all parties left fuming, with Denise promising to make good on her threat. Brian Winchester and his wife Kathy divorced, and soon after that, Denise and Brian were married in a lavish ceremony. Brian became Ansley's stepfather, uh, living in what used to be William's family home, and took over as her father figure. Cheryl was not invited and continued to be denied access and communication with her only granddaughter. The years marched on, with Cheryl doing everything in her power to discover the truth of Mike's fate. She contacted a herpetologist who specialized in large reptiles to help learn about the plausibility of the alligator theory. Professor Matt Oresko wrote in a report that any official explanation attributing Mike's disappearance to an attack by an alligator is highly unlikely. He explained that because alligators derive all of their body heat from external environment, as water temperatures begin to drop in November, their metabolic rate drops as well, and they cease to feed. And they don't begin feeding again until March or early April. So most likely, this was not the case. He further explained how extremely rare it was for an alligator attack to result in a fatality, with only seven fatal attacks recorded in Florida during the 47-year period between 1948 and 1995. In each of those fatal attacks on adults, there was always forensic evidence of the attack or remains found close to the site where the attack occurred, which was not the case with Mike's disappearance. They never found any evidence of this at all. The professor concluded his letter saying, quote, Although attributing the disappearance of your son to an alligator attack may be a convenient explanation for the authorities, the scientific facts surrounding this case indicate that this explanation is virtually impossible, end quote. When Cheryl shared this information with the new detectives assigned to Mike's case, she learned that they did not believe his disappearance had anything to do with alligators. In fact, they believed a different type of predator was responsible for his demise namely his best friend Brian and his widow Denise. And they were stepping up their investigation into the newlyweds' involvement in Mike's fate. One day out of the blue, in April 2004, Brian's ex-wife Kathy, now also remarried, showed up at Cheryl's home. She had some information she wanted to share, and it would be a bombshell. Kathy told Cheryl that on the morning Mike went hunting, Brian had no alibi. He begged off joining Mike at the lake, supposedly because he was going to go hunting with his father-in-law. But he never made that trip either, and left his father-in-law waiting for two hours, later telling him that he had overslept that morning. But Kathy witnessed him leaving their home shortly before 4 a.m. that day, and he didn't reappear until after 4 p.m. when he joined Kathy's family for a Christmas celebration in Georgia. And that left 12 hours unaccounted for with no alibi. But the biggest bombshell Kathy went in part was her suspicions that Denise and Brian were having an affair before Mike disappeared. She had some evidence and strong suspicions, but she couldn't prove it conclusively. Cheryl passed on the information to the new detectives, and they interviewed Kathy, to which she willingly agreed. Kathy also agreed to surreptitiously record conversations with Denise discussing the events surrounding Mike's disappearance. 
In addition to the detectives now working Mike's case, more and more people, including two of Denise's sisters, were starting to suspect that Brian and Denise were involved, if not directly responsible. Investigators with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement brought in Brian for questioning. While they grilled him hard and confronted him repeatedly with evidence they had been collecting, Brian continued to deny any involvement or culpability in Mike's disappearance, but the pressure was starting to bear fruit. On December 14, 2007, Brian called his ex-wife Kathy and begged her to meet with him. She agreed and was outfitted with a secret recording device by the FDLE, hoping to catch Brian making incriminating statements. Brian pleaded with Kathy to say that he was at home on the morning that Mike disappeared. She was the only person who could help him and he begged her to do so. Yet Kathy told him that it wasn't true and she refused to lie on his behalf. The timing of Brian's request was not accidental. That morning, he was contacted by an investigative reporter with the Tallahassee Democrat newspaper, Jennifer Portman, who had been reporting on Mike's case, and especially on Cheryl's efforts to find her missing child. She asked Brian if he had any comment to add to the article she was writing to coincide with the upcoming anniversary of Mike's disappearance. The article began, quote, Investigators say they're closer than ever to a break in the case of a missing Tallahassee hunter once thought accidentally drowned and eaten by alligators, end quote. Despite being optimistic, Mike's case would again stutter to a halt. By 2011, the case had long gone cold, despite Cheryl's perseverance and continued efforts at letter writing, billboards, flyers, and newspaper ads. And she would never give up. By August 2016, 16 years after Mike went missing, the marriage of Brian and Denise had hit rock bottom. Denise had ordered Brian out of the home she once shared with Mike and had contacted a divorce lawyer, who was pushing for a financial settlement that Brian was considering. He was drinking heavily and contemplating taking his life. He had even purchased a handgun to carry out the deed. However, he wanted to speak with Denise one last time, to beg her to give him and their marriage another chance. But Denise refused to see him or even speak with him over the phone, so he opted for a desperate and dire action, one that would lead to Mike's case breaking wide open. At 9 a.m. on a Friday morning in July, Denise got into her car to begin her drive to the office. As she pulled out of the subdivision, Brian came out of hiding in the rear cargo area, climbed over the two rows of seats, and ordered Denise to hand over her phone so she couldn't call for help. He stuck a handgun in her ribs and ordered her to drive. Denise pulled into a nearby CVS store, knowing they had surveillance cameras, and hoping that someone would recognize her distress and come to her aid. Brian told Denise that he had no choice, since she was refusing to talk to him in any way, and this was the only way he could get her to listen to him. Denise agreed to hear him out, and eventually got Brian to agree to speak with his father about his troubled life. Denise swore she would not go to law enforcement about Brian's kidnapping, but as soon as she dropped him off, that's exactly what she did. Denise would sign a complaint charging Brian with aggravated kidnapping leading to his arrest. Brian was denied bail and held in jail awaiting trial. It was during this time that his ex-wife Kathy received a cryptic message from Denise, asking her to tell Brian that she wasn't talking, which was curious given that she had provided a detailed statement to the police regarding the kidnapping. If Kathy was confused by this statement, investigators were not. They correctly surmised that this message was about Mike and not the kidnapping. So basically, she was trying to let Brian know, hey, I'm not talking about Mike. I'm not saying anything. So they stepped up the pressure once again, sensing this was their chance to break open the case that, you know, had troubled them for 16 years. Kathy made additional recorded calls to Denise in which she openly accused Denise and Brian of, quote, getting rid of Mike. Denise did not reply to these direct allegations, as would be expected of any innocent party. The district attorney met with Brian to offer him a plea deal concerning the serious charges of armed kidnapping he was currently facing. The deal offered Brian full immunity for whatever his role was in the disappearance of Mike, as long as he told them the full and absolute truth of what happened to Mike and offered to ask for the minimum sentence on his kidnapping charges when the case went to court. Brian agreed, and then began to reveal the truth of the mystery of what happened to Mike Williams. Brian did indeed meet with Mike on the morning of December 16, 2000, and the two traveled to Lake Seminole in their respective vehicles, caravan style. Since they were running late, Brian suggested that they don their waders before getting in the boat to save time. Brian told Mike he had found a secret duck hunting spot on the lake, so Brian manned the tiller and began to steer the boat to the deepest section of the lake. When they arrived, Brian asked Mike to come to the back of the boat to look at a problem with the motor, and when Mike stood up, 
Brian gave him a giant shove overboard. Mike began struggling as his waders filled with water, but he managed to get them off before they dragged him under, and he swam to a stump to hang on to to keep his head above water. He called to Brian repeatedly for help, but Brian had no intention of helping his best friend. Instead, Brian pulled out his shotgun and aimed it at Mike's face and pulled the trigger. He had planned on Mike drowning in the lake and knew that evidence of the blast ruined that plan. So he grabbed Mike by the legs and towed him back to shore, and he took his body and put it into a dog crate that was in the back of his truck. Then he staged the scene with Mike's boat and headed towards Tallahassee, stopping at Walmart, of course, to purchase a shovel and tarp with which to bury Mike's body. Brian put Mike inside the tarp and drove to another lake, Lake Carr, just five miles from Cheryl's home, and dug a hole that would be Mike's grave for the next 16 years. Investigators would find his bones, still inside his clothes, rolled up in the blue tarp, exactly where Brian told them it was located. They intended for Mike to drown at Lake Seminole, and for his body to be recovered there so it would seem like a tragic accident, since that plan went sideways, necessitating the need to hide Mike's body and the blast to the face they needed to corroborate that story with the evidence that would lead investigators towards the conclusion that he had drowned and been eaten by alligators. In addition to staging the scene with Mike's boat and truck, Brian had left additional breadcrumbs for the investigators. A week into the search, he placed Mike's hunting hat in the water in the vicinity of his boat. Then a few months later, Brian returned to the lake under cover of darkness and planted the waders, hunting jacket with Mike's license in the pocket, and flashlight that had been in Denise's possession. When asked about Denise's involvement, Brian explained that the two of them had been having an affair behind Mike's back for three years before they decided that they were tired of having to hide it from their respective spouses, and they came up with the plan to kill Mike. They orchestrated the life insurance policies to ensure that they would both be paid handsomely for doing the deed. Because duck season would be ending soon, they decided to execute their plan on the 16th. Denise's role in the plot would be to ensure that Mike went on his early morning hunting trip with Brian and then say that he went hunting alone, to protect, you know, to protect them. They both agreed to never speak of the events to anyone, ever. Denise's messages to Brian that she wasn't talking was her reassurance to Brian that she was keeping their pact a secret, and she expected him to do the same, despite her strident pleas to the judge in Brian's kidnapping case to give him a life sentence in the harsh terms of the divorce settlement she was seeking. For kidnapping Denise, Brian was eventually sentenced to 20 years in prison and then 15 additional years of GPS monitoring parole once released. Given his age, he would be nearly 80 at the conclusion of his sentence. While in prison, Brian would come to deeply regret killing his best friend and agree to testify against Denise, should charges be brought against her. You know, he says he regrets it. I don't know. But this exactly happened in 2018. Denise was arrested on multiple charges for her role in Mike's murder, including conspiracy to commit murder, uh, having been a principal in the murder, and accessory after the fact for assisting and aiding Brian to avoid detection and arrest. Now that Denise was a multimillionaire thanks to life insurance proceeds, she hired a good lawyer named Ethan Way. Her defense was essentially that Brian acted alone when he murdered Mike, and that Denise had no knowledge of Brian's crimes, let alone having participated in them in any way. The state alleged that Denise and Brian had conspired together for nine months leading up to the murder of her husband. In addition to Kathy testifying about the events firsthand, the DA, John Fuchs, would heavily stress the importance of the $1.75 million payout and in life insurance from three different policies, with Brian himself selling the largest $1.25 million policy shortly before Mike's death. Fuchs told the six-man, six-woman jury, quote, Denise didn't have the stigma associated with being a divorcee. She wanted to be a rich widow, not a poor divorcee. That left two adulterous lovers with just one option. Mike had to die, unquote. He further cited evidence that Denise had no intention of sharing custody of Ansley or allowing her to go back and forth between the two households. And to protect Ansley from her grandmother Cheryl's suspicions regarding her son's disappearance, Denise cut all ties and refused Cheryl access to her only granddaughter for over 15 years. Brian's ex-wife, Kathy, testified to the multiple recorded phone conversations between her and Denise, during which Kathy outright accuses Denise of planning and participating in her husband's murder. Yet, Denise never denies or refutes the accusations. The calls were played in court for the jury to hear. Fuchs asserted that Denise committed an overt act in the murder of her husband by encouraging and ensuring that Mike went duck hunting with Brian at the lake that morning, knowing what awaited him that day. 
Denise's defense, in addition to maligning Brian's character and credibility, was that not one shred of direct evidence tied Denise to her husband's murder. Brian acted alone, and it was only as he sat in the Florida prison for kidnapping Denise that he decided to enact revenge for his 20-year sentence and accused Denise of conspiring with him. After Denise, quote, threw him under the bus for kidnapping, he would now throw her under the bus by accusing her of conspiring with him to murder Mike, end quote. The defense said that his motive was revenge, pure and simple, and no evidence existed to corroborate his claims, which were made with full immunity from prosecution. Her attorney, Ethan Way, would also argue that the amount of life insurance Mike obtained was reasonable, giving his annual salary of $180,000, and his somewhat risky hobbies um, that involved hunting and guns. I don't know, that doesn't really make sense, but he pointed out that Denise was not opposed to divorce. In fact, she had divorced Brian Winchester in 2016, and that there was no evidence that she was unhappy in her marriage to Mike Williams, or that she was having an affair with her best friend. Denise claimed that she did not begin a romantic relationship with Brian until after Mike's disappearance, in a proper grieving period. It would be five years after his death that Denise would marry Brian. And who would the jury believe? So just two days shy of the 18th anniversary of what everyone now knew was the savage and brutal killing of Mike at the hands of his best friend and possibly his wife, the courtroom was packed to hear closing arguments from both sides before the jury retired to deliberate on their verdict. An initial vote was 9-3, to three, with three members believing that there was reasonable doubt as to Denise's guilt and the other nine believing she was guilty as charged. As they deliberated, two of the three in favor of acquittal changed their vote to guilty, leaving just one holdout. This juror explained his belief that Brian and Denise had conspired to drown Mike on Lake Seminole, and that when Mike managed to rescue himself by climbing out and swimming to the tree stump, and that, and that led to Brian shooting him, that that action belonged to Brian alone, and Denise had never been part of that decision. Nor had she been a party to Brian subsequently burying Mike at Lake Carr. This was the, like I said, this was the argument of one juror. The jury deliberated these and many other issues during their two days in the jury room. They feared that they were deadlocked until they reviewed the exhibits and choice testimony from the trial, at which point they reached a unanimous agreement. The gallery filled quickly to hear the verdict, with Cheryl, Mike's mother, prominently in the front row, hoping for justice for Mike. As the verdict was read, tears streamed down Cheryl's face. Quote, We the jury find as follows as to count one of the indictment. The defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. As to count two, we the jury find the defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. We the jury find as follows as to count three of the indictment. The defendant is guilty of accessory after the fact of first-degree murder. As she had throughout the entire trial, Denise stared straight ahead, showing no visible emotional reaction and never shedding a tear. Jurors and spectators alike would later describe her lack of emotion as cold-hearted. Denise was sentenced on February 6, 2019. There was little suspense regarding the outcome, as Florida law provided only one possible sentence for first-degree murder, life in prison without the possibility of parole. She was also sentenced to 30 years on the conspiracy charge. The proceedings took only 14 minutes. Denise Williams currently resides in the Women's Reception Center in Ocala, Florida. And that's it. Um, thank you for listening to this. Stefan will be back next week. It will be both of us from now on every episode. And we will see you next week. Take care.